Hey friends, we're here for another episode of the Brockton Bay Chronicles. Thanks for being here as my longtime friend Andy continues his journey through the world of Worm by Wild Bow. Andrew, what's up? How you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Fall was here briefly, but it's back up into the 90s. So I don't know what the deal is with that last gasp of summer, I guess, but excited to get into the next section here. Today, we'll be reviewing Arc 18, Queen, Chapters 4 to 5, and the second interlude. And as far as new business, we really don't have it. So nothing today, no questions or comments or anything. So we're just going to dive right on into our review. And we are picking up Chapter 4. And the Undersiders, as we know, have arrived at PRTHQ. And uh, the team is brought up to the headquarters. Miss Militia gets to talking with the deputy director, apprising him of how serious the situation they think is uh, about to come down on their heads, setting the stage pretty well, Wild Bull does, getting the players around the table once again, not unlike, I guess you could say for every situation, you think back to the Slaughterhouse Nine arc and uh, even the arc where uh, Behemoth showed up, the team had a chance to gather, tentatively lay out a, a game plan, and then things went <laughs> either went to plan or they didn't from there. Wild Bull seems to be sticking to a uh, a theme, or am I reading too much into it? I think that's accurate, and it's it's interesting that you see a level of cooperation going on that seems absent from so many things in real life. They recognize that there's this imminent threat and they have protocols in place for it. And then they actually fall through on it. Now that's not to say that it all goes smoothly, mm -hmm. but uh, at least people are willing to come to the table and recognize that something needs to be done and there needs to be cooperation. I really wish that would happen more in our world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but one thing I found really interesting it, that was different about this one was because of Skitter's blindness mm -hmm. and the fact that she there everybody's worried. All the protectorate folks are worried about the undersiders and what they might do. She's she's also kind of bug blind, and so with all the different people talking and and stuff on screens and stuff, she's really kind of limited as to what she's picking up it seems like yeah that was really fascinating uh because up until now we've been so impressed by her ability to use her swarm sense and here she has at this moment uh willingly given up her access to her primary weapon one of her major senses you know mm. And she, I think at one point during the arc, uh, the, either this chapter or the next one, where she does comment on, it's weird to have all this sensory, this awareness of what's going on outside the building more so than what's going on inside the building. It was, um, I don't know if I would say startling, but it was definitely a kind of a, oh yeah, that's right, kind of moment for me when uh, when Wild Bo wrote that there. Yeah, that's that's a great point. It kind of reminds me of uh, some of the old like Star Trek episodes where you know the long range scanners, the mm. short range scanners, or and then something would get knocked out, you know, by a missile or a flash or whatever, and they would still be, you know, something's happening out there. We can kind of see what's going on, but uh, they couldn't see what was on the screen anymore for whatever reason. But I think Skinner handles it pretty well. Mm -hmm. I don't know that everybody would be as adept at trying to maintain that they're functioning normally with, with all the things that are hampering her abilities right now. Uh, let's talk about that. How different would be, how different would the heroes be acting towards Skitter if they knew she was blind? The only people in this room, in this scenario at this moment who know she has no vision are the undersiders. Might the heroes have a different take or be a little more aggressive with her given the situation if they knew I could see it going either way, I guess. You know, one way would be, well, she's partially disabled by this lack of input, so we don't have to worry about her quite as much. They might, you know, actually dial back their mm. concerns about the undersiders being there. 
but they also might see it's the people there are definitely people involved who are pretty unhappy with the undersiders and are would be just fine if they got taken out so uh they might take it as an opportunity to hey we'll take skitter to this room for a minute mm-hmm. okay and then <laughs> yeah who knows what happens to her once the door is closed so i could see it going either way but i think i think she's wise to not let on because it would be oh, yeah. it would be used somehow against them i think yeah no i i agree with that as the team so Let's point out at this moment, the deputy director is the one who Miss Militia is re- reporting to because nobody knows where director Calvert is. Mm, yep. Yeah. One of the guys, <laughs> one of the agents reports that he's gone dark. And most of the, what did Skitter say? Her bugs sense that like a third of the agents in the room look over <laughs> at her and the undersiders because uh, with good reason, they think that the undersiders might have something to do with the fact that, Nobody's heard from Calvert. Yeah, let's let's pause a moment of silence for I'll forget it. I hate <laughs> it. Um, yeah, he had to go. But <laughs> exactly. But yeah, they uh they definitely have their suspicions about the undersiders and what happened to Calvert. It's interesting that and I guess it happens in just about any aspect of crimes or trying to solve mysteries that there are certain biases that creep in whether you like it or not and they're automatically saying well this really good guy calvert got taken down by the evil undersiders without starting to wonder well why why was he out doing what he was doing or whatever why was he if he was the director why was he running all over the place with and you know not trying to figure any of that out so it's human emotion you know our guy's missing. Yep. Where is he? Hmm. These would-be villains we have problems with. They, they're probably responsible for some some kind of way. So, uh, I mean, but right. then again, it's not like they don't. The undersiders don't have a history. So <laughs> they've earned that uh, suspicion for sure. Yep. As the the rest of the the team arrives, the deputy director has them separated into various conference rooms or meeting rooms and so forth. We do get a scene where Rachel, pardon me, where Skitter and Miss Militia uh, recommend to the deputy director that Skitter and Rachel be allowed to be together in order to keep, mm. to keep her under, con- not under control. That's not fair. Just to make her feel more comfortable. And uh, that was a, that was a wise and understandable recommendation. For sure. Rachel is the definite loose cannon of the group and is easily pushed to uh, react. Which we're going to see shortly. Right. But they're in this enclosed space. They're trying, they've are trying. got much bigger fish to fry. And so they're just trying to say, hey, she seems to kind of get along with Skitter. You know, they've got a grudging relationship on Rachel's side anyway. <laughs> and uh, so let's let's try to keep the hounds at bay pun intended yeah like i said the team does get split up into different rooms Gru and imp get sent into uh another room and imp once again is not happy that she's being sequestered away in a room and uh they're putting tape up on the door and saying hey this uh, this person has stranger (laughs) powers and we need to make sure that everybody knows she's in there um (laughs) the situation with triumph moving a little further into the story skitter offers an apology to him for what happened the night wherein she and trickster and genesis made the assault on triumph's family rachel's Hmm. wondering what that's all about why are you apologizing and then she shares the information with him about what happens triumph uh, he seems to come across as a pretty stand-up guy uh, he was more concerned for his father's political aspirations being hurt by what down, what by what went down, arguing for the city to survive. He was more concerned about that than the potential threat on his life. He understood the danger of being a hero, as it were. Yeah, he knew what he was getting into, but as we see throughout the story, the the parahumans are all or I shouldn't say all, a number of them are worried about what's happening to their mundane, if you will, non-triggered family and how that could be either 
uses leverage for, you know, then get them to do something they don't want to do or just to outright take revenge against them uh, indirectly. But yeah, Triumph is worried about his dad's career and they're like, dude, haven't you, you know, all the people are taking the, making the Brockton Bay look like a total cesspool and they're implying that at least your dad is partially at fault. So Mm -hmm. it's not like he, he was on the escalator to the presidency or anything. Right. Yeah. It wasn't his fault that this giant Godzilla like monster came to Brockton Bay and wasted (laughs) the place. It wasn't his fault that this group of murderous psychopaths with uh, superpowers came in after him. But it would be difficult at best for him politically moving forward. Yeah, I can just picture the HR recruiter for trying to look at who's going to be the next person on fill in the blank government appointment position. And it's like, oh, we see a gap on your resume. What were you doing during this time? And he's like, well, I was the mayor of work today. But what? What was that? I was the mayor of Brockton Bay. Oh, well, it was great talking to you. You can get your uh, parking validated at the front. Thanks. See you later. Goodbye. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, dude. Sorry. Moving on a little further, Tattletail engages with Triumph. And Triumph talks about or asks them, what do you villains want at this point? And we get a good conversation between them, too. Uh, what did you think of Tattletail laying out this um her vision of what the relationship between heroes and villains might look like uh, going forward. I, I think it's, it, it fits pretty well. She uses the example of the Yakuza. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's pretty apt. You know that you have kind of the civilian populace, the people that's doing all the work and getting everything done day to day. But then you have all these people that are, Uh, kind of set apart from that with their parahuman abilities, either for good or evil. And the good parahumans obviously don't want the civilians impacted negatively. They want things to prosper Mm -hmm. there. That's what they've kind of sworn to do. But people in the gray area, kind of like the undersiders where yes, they do evil things, but they're not the slaughterhouse. Not, you know, they're not, they're not, it's not gratuitous evil. They're lawful evil, to yeah. use the old D&D terms. Yeah. They have a structure. They want to maintain things. They realize that it's in everybody's best interest to keep the infrastructure chugging along. And so they say, well, we'll just keep the really bad people out. And that's that's always something that uh, law enforcement is kind of hampered in, right? We want law enforcement to follow the rules, mm-hmm. but the bad people don't follow the rules. So that kind of can set folks at a disadvantage right off the bat. I was just uh, watching that movie Judge Dredd again that oh, I've yeah. seen quite a while ago. And that was one dystopian vision of what it might come to, that that law enforcement officers become not only the police, but judge, jury, and executioner. And they just, you know, stuff gets recorded and and it's just, that's the only way to take care of it. So this is kind of a happy medium almost where, You've got the people that are willing to cross the line to try to keep the peace mm-hmm. and try to keep things from getting out of hand. They're offering to do that so that the police can keep or the law enforcement folks, the good, good pair of humans can keep their hands clean. They just need to look the other way. The danger is always that once you start drawing that line in the sand and then crossing the line, it gets easier and easier and yeah. uh, you can justify doing things and then who knows where it ends up. So. It's it's a tough balance. Miss Militia comes into the conference room where Skitter and the heroes and Tattletail and Rachel are, and she talks about the uh, evaluation some of the PRT thinkers have given the situation with Noel. She brings in the information, says this guy rates it this, and another thinker rates it that. All in all, they decide the the protectorate bigwigs have called this a threat level A situation. Tattletail is having none of it. And she's like, no, this is an S class situation. And then she does this great, <laughs> this great read of the PRT manual, uh, the, for how these decisions are made, just boom, 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 you know, rifling these facts back at Miss Militia. It's like, no oh, BS this guy, when it's in this situation, 
it should be this, this, and this to, in order to, to meet the qualifications for a class S and you guys are completely underestimating the situation. How did you like that bit of lawyering from Miss Tattletale? That was excellent. It was, it was like a political fi figure being grilled by the journalists, their, their nightmare, you know, <laughs> just having all the facts and figures that the Politico didn't think they knew about. And here it is, they're laying it out in front of everybody. So for her to quote chapter and verse like that and really lay it out, it's kind of like, all right, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. Why aren't you right. stepping it up and saying that call in everybody? I get that there's a suspicion and that they don't see the undersiders as credible. They're worried that they have some ulterior motive. Mm hmm that that's totally understandable, but those kind of rules and regulations are in place for a reason to try to take feelings and emotions out of the equation that, all right, if all these boxes are checked, then here is the answer. This is what yeah. it is. And for some reason, the protector is just like, nah, we're going to just disregard our checklist. And it's like, okay, I don't get it. So it seems like if anybody's got an ulterior motive, it's the protectorate or uh -huh. somebody in the protectorate, not, not the villains. So hold on to that thought. Okay. That may mean something that may mean something. Okay. Uh, Cause it kind of gets addressed a little bit uh, when somebody important comes up in a, in a little bit. Hmm. I did like this one uh, scene after having this argument with Tattletale and Miss Militia essentially puts her foot down and said, look, I'm not, I'm done arguing with you. I got to go take care of this other situation. Got to go look at this thing. It's when Miss Militia, she tells the wards, tells the guys there to don't let Tattletail bait you. Don't let her get under your skin. And Tattletail comes back at her. And it's like, hey, you know, you can't blame them. I mean, you know, you could have that whole Romeo and Juliet thing between a hero and a villain. And and then Miss Militia comes back and says, hey, I'm talking to you, too. I half expect a tattletale to say, yes, mom, you know, as opposed to I'll be angelic. <laughs> you know? It was just a nice little interlude between those two characters. And Miss Militia's being all stern and laying down the law. And Tattletale could say, OK, mom, I get it, you know. <laughs> yeah, Miss Militia, I really like her character. Um, she strikes a nice balance between having to be kind of the the stern toe the line kind of person, but being open to discussion yeah. and keep trying to keep an open mind. So I think that's pretty remarkable that she operates that way. I like the way she's written. Yeah. Good character. Good character. She also tells them that Parian has taken off. She, as we knew, she didn't want to be a combatant. So she's heading back to her territory with Flechette to escort her to make sure that she doesn't run into any trouble. Dragon is not coming. All she's doing is sending the wristbands that they need for the fight uh, so they can communicate like they did in the Inbringer attack. It's just, hmm. you know, it doesn't seem like, for whatever reason, as you noted, the heroes aren't taking this to the level of importance that it should be. And Tattletail's just kind of shaking her head saying, or not saying, but probably thinking, you guys just don't get it. Uh, yeah, they really don't. And I mean, it's it's somewhat understandable. They haven't got all the backstory and they're only getting it from a pretty unreliable source. Mm -hmm. But if somebody you don't believe is willing to put their hand in the trap or their head in the lion's mouth to help you try to believe what they're saying, then that mean, that should mean a lot. Yeah. But there's just there's just too much bad blood. It seems like there's mm -hmm. so much baggage with this uh, interaction, and maybe there's some uh, jealousy isn't the right word, but you know the protectorate was supposed to make the street safe for everybody, and here it's really kind of the undersiders that are doing that, and so maybe there's folks that are feeling like it's kind of a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. There's there's a lot of different emotional stuff, undercurrents going on here. Yeah, undercurrents. I like that. Idolin shows up as part of the initial wave of responders. 
And that's where we get this whole conversation where Tattletale, we don't know how, but somehow her power has looked at him and understood that he's losing his powers. Maybe not uh, mm. to a, a, a radical degree, but over time, he's losing it losing his power we know this if you recall from that trip out to the oil derrick in the cauldron office right where he got that yeah. booster shot from the doctor uh this was pretty <laughs> this was a pretty gutsy poker move on tattletale's case idolan pulls her into a a bubble and the two of them talk and we get a scene where skitter uses her bugs to try to hear what was going on inside that cone of silence. Hmm. Nice demonstration of how much better she's getting using her power. It's not perfect to hear, but uh, a good demonstration of how far she's come along using it. Yeah. And I think it was nicely balanced with, I think when the screen comes on a little later, she's able to see a, a change in, brightness but not really pick up anything so right. it's not like it's this perfect connection but it definitely has improved and, and so it's neat the way wild bow kind of gets us to see the nuances of how it's improving without just being a flicking a switch to all right now i'm totally plugged into the bug network right yeah no that's that's very good way to do that yeah the audio you can hear that and it's not perfect you get bits and pieces but the video i think you even pointed out before uh the difficulty of making that translation from what the eye what the bugs see to uh her brain's interpretation of, of that data so nice nuance as you said for that this cone of silence this this bubble that he force field that he puts up around himself and tattletale it knocks Rachel and Skitter over and Rachel responds in a very Rachel way. <laughs> and uh, you know her dogs are are growing and she's cursing and Miss Militia and uh, other heroes are on the other side of the bubble and she's got her gun out and finally the uh, the bubble winks out and Idolin's like no no sorry about that I just needed to talk to her in private. Uh I'm going to go get some air. And Tad and Miss Militia like what you do you provoke him? Again legitimate question because the tattletale does like to play mind games and the undersider's reputation is not the greatest among the heroes so we're not surprised by their concern for sure and with tattletale it is hard because it's hard to gauge what her motivation is because mm -hmm. yeah sometimes it seems like she's doing it just to just to flex you know that's hey, I'll just go down this and try to figure it out because it's what I do. But in this case, it seems like it it could be legit, right? I mean, if yeah. this is the heaviest hitter that's showing up and he's not as big a deal as he used to be, then they really kind of need to know that going in that it won't be like, all right, we're at the end of our rope. There's no way out, but hey, Eidolon's here. Mm -hmm. It'll be more like, yeah, he can help, but he's, he's not going to make everything better yeah is he really as strong as he used to be and yeah while they were in that bubble she was relaying kind of why she thinks the they didn't call it a class s threat he wanted to come to test himself in a non-inbringer situation we don't know why Our director costa brown decided to go with a class mm -hmm. a versus a class s threat so she sees it tattletale is nobody's fool and let's not forget, also, Tattletail was initially against recommending someone as powerful as Idolin show up in case he got cloned and they had to fight him. Yeah, so that is a legitimate concern, is this whole cloning thing from Noel. And you don't want people who can get flipped, so to speak, or that you're fighting replicated versions of them. And... One thing that I know I don't know how to phrase it, but mm -hmm. we've all had those situations where we're going into something we know we're not a hundred percent, but we know our capability is good enough that we can we know we can get through mm -hmm. and we can be effective. But that is pretty much assuming that it's a a standard scenario, you know, um, like to use a sports analogy. In football, you know, you're running a route, you're throwing a pass. 
those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And you know that you can do all those things just fine. But what it doesn't account for is what if the pass is intercepted and all of a sudden you're defending instead of, you know, you've got to flip the script really fast or it's a loose ball and you got to dive for it or whatever. Yeah. That's not a usual thing. And and if you're not 100%, that might not be something you can do. And all of a sudden you're limiting the team and, and causing problems. And so I think that might be a concern is that, yeah, Eidolon will be fine, but what if his foot gets caught in a <laughs> in a root or something and he can't get out and then he's cloned, you know, then we're screwed. So something that needs to be considered. Yeah. If you're looking at all the, the possibilities. So more of the heroes arrive and then <laughs> Noel phones in. Talk about your ET <laughs> phone home kind of thing. Oh, man. This was dark. This was extremely unnerving. She calls into PRT headquarters and talks about her desire for vengeance against the undersiders. She talks about how she's, she captured Vista, how she could smell, how powerful she was. She says Vista's dead. She's cloned Vista several times. Gru, um, who's now in the room and standing behind, behind Skitter, Gru tells her, uh, describes to her the scene that's playing out on the uh, the big screen that's in the, in the conference room. This was a very disturbing, not as disturbing as uh, I guess you could say the visual of Noel the first time we got it from Trickster's point of view. But was it five Noels and the sixth one ran off? Or pardon me, five Vistas and the sixth one ran off to go murder her family. This was this was bad. The whole thing about it was creepy and really tends to underscore what Tattletail was trying to get across, that this is something that you are underestimating. Mm -hmm. She's already making clones. She's apparently able to smell from wherever she is and be able to detect somehow who's there. And so when Miss Militia lies about it, yeah. She's like kind of calls her on it. Yeah. And then you've got all these clones already. And the, the other one that's decided to go off and kill the family. So it's really showing how, how much variation there is with these clones. You know, they're just these poor duplicates, poorly made duplicates with malevolent intent and dysfunction. So you don't know from one to the next what they're going to do. Right. Yeah. Don't know what they're going to do. Don't know what their motivation is. And uh, I think it was Ballistic who said they're not on our side when uh, when she makes a clone, mm -hmm. the, the clones are not a, on our side. So the deal that Noel offers the, the heroes is this. Give me the undersiders. Kill them or give them, you know, knock them out, injure them, leave them for me to, to attack so I can have my vengeance. Do that. And I'll find the clones and kill them. Otherwise, until you do this, I am going to make it hard on you heroes. Give me my vengeance and this ends. Yeah. The other, the other creepy thing she mentions is that she feels like she's losing her grip on oh, herself, yeah. mm -hmm. that she might be kind of going into, you know, and bring her territory where she's no longer rational. necessarily. She's just striking out. She's just, in attack mode and, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get stronger and stronger. And that that's even more scary. I think is that to have an intelligence behind it, she's got something she's willing to kind of bargain. albeit a, a really bad bargain for the undersiders, obviously. But if that's gone, then yeah, all bets are off. And it sounds like uh, she's just going to, the power is going to ramp up and up and she's going to be harder and harder to try to stop. Right. And now we move on to interlude number two, Crusader. And we get to spend a morning with the pure. Uh, boy, uh, <laughs> talk about talk about wondering where this one was going during my first read. And uh, it took me a, it took me a little while to realize that, oh, this is Theo from earlier and when mm. uh, the the S9 first got to Brockton Bay. How long did it take you to figure things out? It took a good chunk. I mean, 
call me weird, whatever. But when the first two sentences of a chapter are water torture, it just kind of <laughs> puts me off. It, it makes it yeah. hard for me to, I lose my balance. A bit. Sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was probably a good halfway through before I, I realized that, uh, well, you only have this much time and you, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand people. I'm like, Oh, that's right. That's right. There was a deal that was made when they were recruiting, but yeah, this is like the, the, the cleavers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a weird twisted alternate universe or something. Yeah. Uh, in this instance, wild Bo gives us this thoroughly unlikable character. Okay. Let's accept the fact that, you know, he's part of a, a, a raging group of white supremacists and we know all the, <laughs> the, the hatred and, and nonsense that goes along with that. So in addition to that, this Justin guy is just a jerk. If you met him on the street, you wouldn't want, want to hang out with this guy because he's obnoxious. Yeah. His, his pattern throughout this whole thing is just very kind of, passive aggressive confrontational mm -hmm. always poking at things and trying to get get a reaction out of folks and right uh, uh, right and the point i'm sorry the point the second part of that point i wanted to add to that was wild bull uses this character to actually dump a whole lot of very interesting information mm. in this interlude I, that was the second part i i got a little spaced out there that was the second part i was trying to drive to gotcha yeah and and that's so it makes it a little hard for me to digest that information mm -hmm. then, right? Because I'm so fixated on, uh, you know, it's like I've got this really good looking piece of food or whatever I'm going to have to eat, but it's on a a dirty plate. I've got dirty utensils and there's <laughs> flies going all over it. So you're like, mm -hmm. um, well, okay, I'm, I'm interested, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the delivery is 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 not doing it for me here. So so yeah, every time he says something, you're like, all right, is that him being yeah, twisted and way off on the edge somewhere with his mm -hmm. philosophy, or is it is this a legit point? And again, the other thing that really, you know, made it hard for me to to hang in there with some of this stuff is that, you know, the people are right there. It's like, oh, we should do this. We should do that. It's like, dude, I'm sitting right here. I don't want any of that. Yeah, the Theo's not about it. I mean, he <laughs> we know that Jack Slash gave him I believe it's two years to get powers, correct? If, if right. I remember that yep. correctly. Yeah. And so he in that scene back in the back in Brockton Bay, he mm -hmm. saved his stepsister, his baby stepsister Aster, and saved Caden from Jack cutting them both down. And so Caden, uh, purity, she, uh, has taken him in and is on a quest to help him get powers. And meanwhile, as you said, we have breakfast with the, the cleavers and, <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah. The, you go to the closet and hanging up in a closet are a bunch of white sheets and pointy hats, but um, <laughs> moving on, they decide to go to on a, on a fact finding mission, Caden, Justin and Theo go to Harvard. They're initially going to meet up or want to meet and to talk with a professor, but he's not there, but his TA is this poor guy named Peter. Peter does dump a whole lot of useful information that is pretty fascinating. And I wanted to find out how did you like that? How did that information dump help inform your thoughts on the story thus far? Did it, you glean anything new? Did it get any more uh, your uh, brain cells turning around? Definitely. Yeah, this is, I think if I lived in this world, this is the kind of work I would want to be doing. would be trying to, if I wasn't in that line of work, it'd be a hobby where I'd be like the people who track all the satellites and have a database. And Oh, sure. I could tell you when stuff's going to be up. I'd be like, all right, so Here's the numbers that we heard this last week. We had two new tinkers, mm -hmm. one new master, you know, and I'd be trying to detect patterns, you know, and doing all the data mining and everything. So I really got into this, as you can tell. I, I definitely mm -hmm. heard it out on it. But, um, 
it's interesting how they talk about how the and it's stuff we've talked about too just the different variables that are happen around a trigger event and mm-hmm. how how the interaction is really hard to tease out and there seems to be patterns there are things that they're discovering but it's not there's no guarantees there's all sorts of different things that can can, can come up and i like the kind of analogy they use where it's like using a a screwdriver to try to pry nails out of something you know uh-huh. it's like yeah it'll work for that but that's not what it was designed to do so if, if somebody's hoping for a certain kind of power but they're the power they got dealt isn't really that there's some kind of interaction between their desire and the real thing and they come out sort of that way but skewed and possibly twisted and so yeah there was a lot of really interesting discussion around this i really enjoyed this interlude a lot aside from the the white supremacist part well yeah that <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah um, <laughs> all that yeah to give that an adequate amount of discussion because it is part of the story justin is a believer Caden, if you recall she was nominally on board with uh, her husband's uh, belief in the the whole white supremacy thing theo doesn't come across as really being into it at all we get that brief discussion where justin is wondering why i guess there's another organization that they're affiliated with why they were leaving night and fog underneath purity's umbrella and there was a whole discussion about mm. that so th- there's there's some politics as to what's going on why purity hasn't lost them is it better to have them with her or not and like i said purity's not necessarily down for the struggle as deeply as justin is uh i bring all that up just to flesh out the the character a little more fully gotcha yeah and that's that's a great point and and there, there are definitely parallels with that whole movement not that i am you know a scholar by any means but generally you have the folks that are like there's there's a spectrum of what quote unquote purity is you know it's uh it's switching to like the the russian side of that you know if you were from a certain part of russia you weren't considered as pure russian as the folks from like the main part of russia mm-hmm. and so you know if you were trying to get through the communist party and rise in the ranks you had to overcome that impediment you know that you were georgian for instance mm-hmm. rather than mm-hmm. mainline russia and so there's always been this kind of you see it in caste systems for instance and you know we saw it in in mexico and in you know people in the indigenous people in our country before we mm-hmm. arrived you know if you were captured by another tribe and then you had kids in that tribe then those kids were never fully accepted the way somebody who would both parents were from the tribe originally you know and so it's just kind of a human nature thing you see it a lot but with this this kind of group it's it's definitely not a matter of all right we don't accept you as full-blooded or we don't accept we don't tolerate you as much it's like no we want to wipe you out because you're polluting things yeah, and it's just yeah, it's so hard to to grasp. But yeah. uh it was but it's it was necessary for I shouldn't say necessary. It was interesting again, uh, repeating myself slightly, that we had to see this interlude through the eyes of a thoroughly unlikable character in order to get some pretty uh, vital information. Um, you know okay wild bow i I see you (laughs) i mean yeah it was it was it was effective it 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 was strong enough of an interlude to keep my interest once we got to the school and peter was uh relaying this this juicy information on triggers yeah and i i have to commend wild bow i mean as a writer i don't think i would want to write about these kind of folks Mm -hmm. but i think it makes the world more three-dimensional to recognize that you have these these messed up fringe elements out there and they're probably just as likely to get powers as 
uh, somebody who's living in Australia or, sure. you know, somebody in Malaysia or whatever. So why wouldn't there be people that were then like, oh, well, I got this because I'm pure. So let me find mm-hmm. other people that are like me and then we can try to get rid of all the unpure people. Yeah. So, I, I, again, I commend Wild Bo for being able to write it this way because I don't think I could stomach it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as I said, Peter's given a pretty good information dump. And he covers all kinds of interesting theories on powers, who gets them. He talks about how uh, governments are doing what they do, trying to sure. improve their standard, uh, their ability to generate parahumans. Obviously, if you're a government and you can make parahumans at a whim, then you're going to flaunt that over other nations of the world. Hmm. Yeah, and I like that Peter said that based on their data, it's harder when you're trying to provoke the trigger event, mm-hmm. you know, that it's more likely to happen in a, a surprise thing or when I think he said, used the term earlier, the participants are in the dark, so they don't know that their their trigger is trying to be provoked or stimulated. And he goes into details on, on why they think that might be, you know, and and of course, Justin jumps on, oh, it's predestined. Mm-hmm. So then then we get back to the purity thing. You know, I'm chosen. This is uh, this is something that's all about the people that didn't get it. Well, you are the outcasts. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, dude, let it go. <laughs> it's not <laughs> he's not a believer. OK, he's one of your one of your little uh, cadre people there. So. It takes Peter, he doesn't actually ever realize who it is. We should um, point out the fact that Justin and uh, Caden and Theo, you know, they're not in costume. They've gone on to the Harvard campus in civilian garb, gone to this Professor Wysocki's office just to get some information. So they're not, you know, Purity, the supervillain, didn't fly up into the office carrying her baby girl. Uh, it was only much later as we're moving further into the uh, into the interlude where they actually point out that Theo is the son of Kaiser. And then, pardon me, that yeah, Theo's the son of Kaiser. And then Peter finally puts it all together mm. and is suitably frightened. Yeah, that I mean, he's he's in full on T.A. mode, right? He's just mm-hmm. he was he was sitting here all by himself. He's there all the time. Nobody ever shows up. He thought they were students. It turns out they're not, but he's he's wanting to just share what he knows, you know, because sure. it's it's interesting to talk about. It's nice to know, nice to come across people who want to know. But then, yeah, he starts having just, you know, he, at one point he says, like, are you talking about starving the guy? And they're like, no, no, <laughs> we're, we're speculating. But, yeah, then when it clicks, then he's like, oh, crap. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have spilled all this information to <laughs> these people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do get what I'm. I'm pretty sure uh, is Caden's trigger event, where uh, Justin's thinking about this um, item mm. he'd heard from the people in the Empire, the Empire's grapevine, about a 16 year old girl driving for the first time has an accident, rolls down a hill, no one sees her for days, and then she triggers, and he looks over at. Caden and Caden nods her head basically because the light goes on for Justin. It's like, ah, this is mm. Purity's origin story. She nods at him and they both kind of silently agree that this Peter does know what he's talking about. The cops are showing up and that's where Justin starts to put the hammer down on, on Peter. It's like, okay, so yeah, you know who we are. You know, we mean business. We're running out of time. You got five minutes to tell me what I want to know about giving this kid a trigger event or I'm going to kill you. No pressure. No pressure, bro. Yeah. And Peter goes back to the thing that any teacher would say, you've got to take the class. You know, I can't pump it all in your head in five minutes. What are you thinking? But of course, the crusader isn't going to have any of that. He just he wants to have it all. Right. And then while they're while they're winding down this conversation, crusader begins to use his power. And we get descriptions of the ghostly, these uh, apparitions stepping forward from his body and going out and uh, doing battle with the PRT and uh, other authorities. 
while they continue, while he and Caden continue the conversation with uh, with Peter. Yeah, and it's interesting that Peter focuses on asking how Kaiser and Allfather had their triggers, right, and that there might be some kind of link. Uh, you know that there were similarities between Allfather's power and Kaiser's power, mm-hmm. and so third generation it seems to continue the trend if you will and he's trying to get at well what what could that be and then maybe even stipulating that it's not a physical power that they had but it was mental and and that physical events tend to cause physical powers mental events tend to cause mental powers and so yeah i thought that was an interesting tidbit there too yeah and Meanwhile, when uh, Justin is doing some some self examination, yeah. we find out this dirtbag tried to pull the plug on his sister. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, he was quite the specimen even before he got his powers. You know, sometimes you think that the the trigger events and stuff make people bad or or push them over the edge, but it seems like he was pretty much there before he got he got his powers. Yeah, he was broken going into this whole thing. Yeah. So as we're heading toward the end of the interlude, the end of the interlude, something that Peter says switches on a light switch for Justin, and he fi- he figures out what he takes a guess at what Theo actually needs. It was the discussion about mm. how um, what was it? Uh, the people who trigger don't have a good support system. Thank you. Usually, yes. Thank you very much. Did that spark anything for you with a uh, certain uh, certain bespeckled dark haired girl in Brockton Bay? <laughs> it didn't until you said it, but there's there's definitely a pattern. You know, Rachel, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Tattletail, Gru. They're all folks that feel like they're not. They've got to do it on their own, or they're not. They're not going to be able to uh, count on on others and so they and you know it's it becomes like a chicken and egg thing you know does Mm -hmm. does the power come because of that realization or is it kind of a predestined thing where there are people who are just dealt a bad hand and that kind of primes them for this but yeah justin just latches onto that says all right we're leaving right And uh, that switch had to be the realization of the role abandonment played or could possibly play in getting Theo his power. Because earlier in the interlude, it was when Caden had said that if he didn't get powers, they'd fight the nine. And unwittingly being a backstop for Theo. A, uh, well, if push comes to shove, we'll do it. And Justin appears to have realized, no, we have to abandon this kid. And something, he has a greater likelihood of having a trigger event if he's abandoned. And we'll see. We're really actually doing him some good. Yeah, it's, uh, I I can see kind of the logic. But hearkening back to what Peter said earlier, you can't kind of provoke the event or it seems like it doesn't go well Mm -hmm. you know you've got plenty of examples where traumatic things happened and then people didn't come out of it really well uh with their powers and so and you know the whole cauldron thing was about all right when you do this when you get the potion you're gonna feel horrible and you need to do your best not to freak out about it you need yeah. to try to go with the flow because the more you fight it, the more likely bad things are going to happen. And so it's, it makes sense. I, I can connect the dots, but I don't know that it's necessarily, uh, I don't know that it's, yeah, it, it's got a, a pretty high risk, I think. Yeah. All right. And with that, we will be moving on to the final chapter that we're going to cover in this episode chapter five we're picking up back immediately after the call from noel at prthq 
Tattletale is the first one to speak and uh, points out that this really wasn't the worst thing that could happen and then talks about what could have, how things could have been worse. And if Noel had gone dark after the undersiders had come to the, the authorities, then their credibility with the authorities would have gone through the floor heading toward magma. Let's see here. She also talks about how Noel, she can produce more vistas at any time. She's highly mobile in addition to having vistas power. And again, you PRT people may end up regretting not calling this a class S threat. Yeah. And apparently Tattletail picked up on some stuff too, you know, that Noel said that Vista was dead, but she doesn't believe that. Right. And so that there, yeah, like you said, she can create more Vistas. And so there does seem to be this thing where Noel has got enough on the ball that she's, she's able to mess with folks and she's sensing things that they don't know how to keep her from sensing them. So, and then to top it all off, more of the bad blood pops up in the protector. It's like, Oh yeah, no, this is like, we're supposed to trust you all and what you're telling us. Yeah. I, I don't want to give uh to blow past what battery, uh, pardon me, what uh, assault had to say. And he's dealing with the mm. loss of battery at the, what he believes to be the hands of the undersiders, or if not directly, indirectly, they're responsible for the loss of, of battery. So mm -hmm. as we find out a little later in this, uh, in this chapter, Tattletail fully expects for him to try to screw them over. And we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that. As the teams are getting ready to get divvied up, Miss Militia is going to take the lead. Um, I guess they've got all the heroes that they expect for the fight. Whoever's going to be there is going to be there. And she uh, says, okay, this is how we're going to handle this situation. The deputy de director agrees and the teams begin to hand to head out. Yeah. Salt is pretty mad. He's, he's looking for vengeance and Miss Militia plays the, the battery card and says, uh, would battery want you to put your feelings and prejudices before duty and the safety of this city and assaults? Like, do you want to play this, play that card? And she's like, yeah, I'll play it. Uh, and if the undersiders play fast and loose with the truth, with the, uh, the truce, then, uh, I'll be in favor of putting out a kill order on them or recommending mm -hmm. a kill order. So, uh, things got even more real for the undersiders. Yeah, this is turning into a worse and worse deal all around. You know, they're just, uh, they're stuck with the whole thing going on. And then they kind of sort of convince the protectorate that there's a legitimate threat and they're mm -hmm. going to cooperate. But by the way, if, if you guys, if we think you're looking at us cross-eyed or whatever, then we'll take you out too. So yeah, this is just... And, Interesting yeah, that Dino talks about how this is. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, it was put out on the Slaughterhouse Nine too. That it doesn't matter. It's not just a kill order from the Protectorate. It's like anybody, you know, shoot on sight kind of thing. If that mm -hmm. comes off, so it's it's pretty. That's pretty chilling. I mean, where are they going to go? Yeah, no, it's it's real. Uh, yeah, you guys have gotten so powerful, and you guys have gotten so slippery that. If you take mm. advantage of this situation, uh, we, uh, Miss Militia is like, I will have no choice but to recommend that you guys be taken out. That's how serious this situation is. Um, tattletale. When, uh, when Skitter offers acceptance of this uh, uh, agreement with what Miss Militia has laid out, undersiders fully cooperate, and if they don't, boom. Uh, tattletale immediately calls Skitter the boss. When Skitter says, yeah, we'll go for it. Tattle says, says, yeah, you're the boss. We'll accept it. And uh, Skitter notes, she was quick enough on the draw that I suspect that there was a reason she said it. Tattletail's playing Tattletail games and um, for whatever mm -hmm. reason had that quick response and uh, putting Skitter forward as the team leader. Yeah, I think, as you said, Tattletail playing her own games. You know, I think she knows that if the debate continues or 
if anybody brought up something that it would detract from what's going on and she doesn't want maybe other things to come to light or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so she just seems to want to kind of put an end to that conversation. And then she immediately jumps in. All right. Hey, I've got some news. Yeah. (laughs) So um, let's see here. Yeah. This is not dead. Noelle can make more vistas whenever she wants to. Uh, question was, how do you hold on to Vista? Good question, but I don't, you know, Tattletail still, she doesn't know everything about Noelle. So she's giving her best guess that her power will uh, will help her uh, put forth. So the meeting winds down. Miss Militia details a or dispatches the Chicago wards with the undersiders. So they've got a group of young heroes with them. How did you like that scene uh, mm-hmm. as the as the meeting broke up when um, Skitter asked Rachel to uh, <laughs> kick the plywood from the window since she brought in this massive swarm? I, I don't. I didn't really get that. It seemed like since she had the swarm outside, she could have just waited till they got outside, and then it would have been like, "All right, I'm not in your I'm not in your house anymore, so I'm just going to get ready for battle." I'm drawing my bugs and then do it then doing it in the, the headquarters seems like, you know, it was like lighting up a cigarette when you're standing in a pool of gasoline. It's just, just kind of, it a didn't ma- seem like a, the best way to go. A massive kind of flex on her part, huh? I guess so. Yeah. I don't know why she feels like everybody's already shaking in their boots around her and sure that she's got something up her sleeve. So I don't mm-hmm. know why she feels like she's got a, crank it up and make it a huge slap on the face that yeah i do have this don't forget it's like we didn't forget we're we're peeing our pants over here that we have to partner up with you in the first place so does this speak to where skitter the villain aka taylor hebert where her mind has evolved i mean in these many months of villainy um time and time again she's felt the need to uh, phrase this make sure people uh, knew how powerful she was or how she better way to phrase it, how she presented herself was important to her. You think back to that scene with Charlotte in her lair, even when she came back from being beat up with the fight with mannequin, she was worried about how she presented herself to her underlings. And in this situation, we've got this new group of wards who we haven't seen them before. They haven't seen us. And I've got to flex and make sure they know who the undersiders are kind of thing. Am, uh, am I drawing unnecessarily unnecessary parallels here? No, I, I think that's a legit parallel. Uh, I did overlook something, though, as I'm reading back through this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's sitting there and we had commented on how she's very limited with the few bugs she has and all these people flowing around the room and trying yeah. to keep track of things. and. And now she's got a whole new group of people and she's about to go into this fight against a baby end bringer kind of situation. And she just wants to know what's going on. And so it says, you know, they were watching us. I couldn't even guess at their expressions without the yeah. ability to see or feel things with my bugs. I was getting tired of this and my fatigue was wearing on my already thin patients. So I think the flex was definitely a piece. Of it, but I think the other thing was is just, I just need to know what's going on. And I'm, I'm just, tired i want to wait any longer so a little, a little of both a little stand both, by huh? my statement that it was yeah a little of both but also a little reckless on her part but that's again probably because she's tired so mm-hmm. yeah the wards these uh group of chicago wards tell me uh i mean we get the information from skitter about this group uh interesting sounding group yeah i mean ray mancer wanton <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i thought it was funny that it was there was tecton and wonton um, and i was wondering is is the last guy going to be anton i don't know you know <laughs> i've seen a pattern here but it, i'm sure they, and you know they're kind of joking about it but this is something i've seen or imagined must be a challenge if you're or even in role-playing games you know I can remember being in stuff and it's like, oh man, I got to think up another name for a, sure. a character. Dang, what's it going to be? You know, and you end up 
Scruffy or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> There's a dog named Scruffy laying there. You're like, all right, Scruffy, because uh, you can't think of anything. So, I mean, Wild Bo is coming up with all these cool names, all mm-hmm. these cool powers, all this stuff on both sides of the coin, the villains and the protectorate folks, the wards. And so, yeah, I got to cut them a little slack, I guess. I just thought it was funny that there were two that sounded very similar in the same group. And then one of them, I think he even poked fun at it with what? Like the, like the food. You know? <laughs> why, why is your name wonton? Like I mean, a shrimp th- wonton or is it like a veggie wonton? I mean, I'm, right? I'm just trying. Yeah, of course it's, it's imp and, and uh, regent, the ones oh, that yeah. are just kind of you know, throwing shade at them like that. <laughs> so yeah, you are as deep into this story as we are and wild bow is still coming up with new capes with extremely creative powers Mm. you know this uh, description of of tecton was similar sort of kind of to mannequin but uh but different enough to be very interesting yeah and and he's you know we've seen other folks that can kind of do things with geological or architecture but this is a combination of somebody who's created these tools to be able to do it and really control it through that. And he gains this energy through doing it. So it's, it's, it's a really neat combination, but with cool variants to it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've got, uh, as you said, uh, Tecton, Wanton, Grace, and Raymancer. And uh, they've been teamed up with the Undersiders, and they're going to head out. Uh, everybody's been given their assignments. Right. We don't want to miss the fact that Tattletail is going to go after Ballistic to try to bring him on board. And she's also um, looking to grab Scrub because she thinks he, he and Flechette may be the only people who might have a chance to deal real damage to uh, Noelle. Yeah, so Tattletail's using her powers. She's trying to figure out what'll work. She also comments that Taters are probably the best folks because that's mm-hmm. not something that if Noel clones it, that all of a sudden they're gonna they they won't have the tools, right? They right. they'll just be they might have the power to make them, but they won't have you know their equipment. So so that's a good idea. But yeah, trying to get these other folks involved with and Scrub is is an interesting one he's one of those kind of fringe guys that you hear a little bit about but Mm -hmm. it seems like there's some legitimate horsepower there you know and that could do some some real damage so that's that's good and and bottom line the cloning thing is is a real it's like a a a bad version of the zombie movie right i mean every everything that noel touches is probably going to just start replicating and so you need to let everybody know hey if you're not gonna join in then get the heck out of here we don't want you anywhere near this yeah and they have no idea what noelle's range is or how far she can smell people and so yeah you need to get hold of anybody that you think could be bad if noelle clones them so yes and as we're moving toward the end of the chapter the team has gone mobile Skitters on one of the dogs with Rachel, the rest of the group, the wards, and the rest of the undersiders are in a containment van heading down the road, heading t- toward ballistics territory. Things are okay for a little while, and then buildings begin stretching and tumbling, and Skitters' bugs tell her that there's trouble. The vistas are in the area. Yeah, and I think Wild Bow kind of does a good job of hinting at how worn out Skitter is. And I don't think I picked up on it all the time, but the beginning of this, she thinks she's just thinking too hard and it's making her dizzy riding on the back of the dog bounced around. You feel the pain. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, no, wait a minute. Stuff is off kilter. Oh, that's, and that dawns on her then that it's Vista. And so I think we get another point there where, she realizes that. And then when she goes looking for him with her powers, mm-hmm. she finds that there's one on a 
rooftop a block ahead, but not in costume. And she realizes, oh, dummy. I knew already that they weren't in costume. Gru had told me that when he saw it on the screen. So why was I looking for her to be in costume? Yeah. Because you're right. She's but been it just going. Shows that- she's been, I'm sorry to interrupt. She's, she's been going and, and Wild Bo pointed that out. Yeah. That it's only been 24 hours since the battle to free, um, to free Dinah has come to a conclusion. Right. And she had severe smoke inhalation. She's got, busted ribs probably she's been blinded from the stuff with the debate and mm-hmm. so yeah she's running on like three out of eight cylinders yeah and and wild Bo doesn't keep like just saying it you know oh she was hampered or whatever he he like leaves these kind of hints that say oh i didn't pick up on that or and then as a reader you're kind of like oh that's right mm-hmm. that's cool she- i like the way he did that no, absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah, and she is definitely not at a hundred percent. And he's got this clever way of, as you said, it's, it's not beating us over the head with it, but he puts it in in a way that it's like, oh Jesus, that's right, she is hurt from this, and oh my God, yeah, she hasn't had a chance to sleep. So yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a good way of pointing out that she is not at her best going into a pretty what could be a, a a pretty brutal fight. Yeah. And there's another example here where, where Rachel hits the van and it seems like Skitter is thinking at first, is Rachel mad at the people in the van for some reason? What's going on? And then she realizes, no, Rachel was trying to get the van out of the way mm-hmm. because the building was coming down. And if they had proceeded, they wouldn't have maybe got hit by the building, but they would have got hit a lot harder by the debris and stuff. Yeah. And uh, as we're coming toward the end, uh, Skitter begins to make a, a horrific realization. Noel is deploying or employing the same kind of fight strategy that Skitter does. And Skitter realizes that she's better at it than I am. She's faster. Her senses reach further. It's, it's a really bad situation that she finds herself in. I believe for the first time in her costume career, finding herself on the other side of a ranged attacker with multiple minions who, and is physically, you know, stronger and, you know, kind of a mutant. So um, welcome to it. It's not exactly a swarm of bugs descending on your skitter, but uh, someone who's effective at using minions in battle, maybe more, even uh, a little more so than you more effective. Yeah, this is, I mean, it. I see it as a good and a bad thing. So mm-hmm. it's bad because Skitter knows what all the advantages of our, of this are and because Noelle is using human minions that she seems to be, there's, there's none of the translation that needs to occur that Skitter has to do with bugs. Mm-hmm. She's getting inputs that are straight. It's a pair of human eyes at human eye level seeing human eye things. And so who knows how much of that is getting through Noel, but if, yeah, it could be really scary if she's able to, uh, how connected she is to all this. Now, I think it's interesting though, that just in the interlude, Mm -hmm. Justin was creating minions that couldn't be cloned. And so if they can somehow work Justin into this Mm. and get him to, combat the swarm then it's swarm on swarm without you know it it could be a good good countermeasure but the good side of it from skitter is that because of the way her brain works anybody can out the weaknesses and the gaps in a swarm type attack it would be her as the queen of the swarm right gotcha all right and that brings us to the end of the chapter Looks like we're done for this episode. Any final, pardon me, any final thoughts there, bud? Anything to add? Um, I was left wondering about Dragon and mm-hmm. why, why there isn't more there. Now, it might be, you know, other factors kind of behind the scenes and other motivations going on, but Tattletail was saying a Tinker would be the best way to combat this and mm-hmm. dragon seems like it would be really great for this 
you know, those uh, drone things could go around and mess with the things. There's all sorts of ways that that dragon could help a lot of this. And she or it is off doing other things. So I'm hoping that I'm guessing things are going to keep getting worse and worse. I'm hoping dragon shows up, is able to turn the tables. But I kind of wish wish it was there now. Yep. All right. We shall see. And that brings us to the end of part two, folks. In part three, we will review chapters six and seven and the third interlude. So that's it for now. We're going to pack it in. We appreciate you being here, spending time with us as always. We hope you will return for part three as Andy moves further and further into this insane arc and uh, who knows what's going to happen by the time we get to the end so thanks for being here folks and until next time take care really excited to to learn more about what these theories are and uh, see what might happen and yeah it's going to be swarm on swarm in brockton bay so we'll see what happens and i'm really looking forward to finishing off the rest of this arc thanks for joining us on this journey until next time bye bye Thanks for joining us in this podcast. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we hope you return. Music is by the band Why Why Not from their self-titled debut CD. You can find more information in the link down below. Catch you later.